Hi, everybody. It's Rich Walitsky, and we're coming to you live from USCA here in Hollywood, Florida. And one of the things we wanted to do this morning is kind of capture some of the conversations that have been going on in the hallway and over coffee about the importance of the new data that came out of the International AIDS Conference in Durban about viral suppression. As you may have heard, data came out that showed that there were no HIV transmissions that could be linked back to someone who was virally suppressed as part of the extended follow-up to HPTN 052. Those data have huge implications for HIV prevention, for public health, and even more importantly, for the lives of those of us who are living with HIV. And that's really what we wanted to talk with you all about today, is kind of spend a little bit of time talking about what these data mean to real people who are doing this work and are living with the virus. And so we've kind of brought together a, a great group of people who are here at USCA and are passionate about their work in these issues. <laughs> and we're going to take a little bit of time to hear their perspectives on this issue. So I'm going to ask folks to just introduce themselves real quickly. Gina, let's, ladies first, let's start with Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gina Brown. I live in New Orleans. I am the Community High Impact Prevention and, um, Program Coordinator <laughs> at the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies in New Orleans. And a member of? And a member of PACHA. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Murray Penner. I'm the Executive Director of the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors, or NASDAD, and I live in Washington, D.C. And this is really a passionate area of interest for me, one that I think we've got to be focusing on. When you look at some of the projections in terms of what can be done and accomplished by emphasizing that people with an undetectable viral load do not transmit the virus, it's huge. I mean, it has mm -hmm. huge impacts, not to mention what it does for our lives. Mm -hmm. So I'm right. excited about this right. conversation. Great. We're glad you're here, Murray. Hi. Good morning. I'm Terrence Calhoun. I have been working in the field of HIV and AIDS for over 20 years and am excited to be here. I'm doing some consulting work right now and just really passionate to share my story, which I've been doing for the last couple of years, which you'll get to hear more later. Excellent. Hi, I'm Bruce Richmond. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Prevention Access Campaign. And um, our goal is to make sure that this incredible, life-changing, stigma-busting, transmission-preventing information gets out to people with HIV and people vulnerable to HIV and to the general public in a way that's accurate and meaningful. So we actually, we do this 24 seven to ensure that all of you understand the latest research. Um, we're a group of HIV advocates, activists, communication experts, and the researchers from the latest studies that are working together to make sure that you have this information. Well, let's, let's talk about what, what the information means to the lives of people with HIV. So I think, you know, Dr. Carl Diefenbach from the NIH kind of summed the data up real clearly. Basically, somebody with an undetectable viral load is not infectious, and the risk of transmitting HIV sexually is negligible. So I know for me, that kind of has lifted a, a weight off my shoulders that I didn't always know that I was carrying, and there was always that fear in the back of my mind that I might somehow unintentionally transmit HIV to my husband. And that kind of brought distance yes. and challenges in our relationship, even though um, he loves me very, very much. And so what, what, I see people nodding their heads. Yes. What, what about you all? Gina, what, let's start with you. Well, for me, um, I haven't been in a relationship in years because of that fear, that mm. fear of if the condom breaks, if this happens, if that happens. And when I heard the news, I was so excited as a woman living with HIV to finally have something concrete to tell people about. You know, I do a lot of community um, work and I can actually go out and tell people, this is why it's important for us to stay on our meds. This is why it's important for us to go to the doctor. This is why it's important for us to know where we are, you know, virally. Mm -hmm. Are we suppressed? Are we working towards suppression? Because mm -hmm. it's so freeing, you know. I'm ready to date now. I'm 50 <laughs> and I'm ready to start dating. Yes, I am. Right. Because now I can educate whoever I get in a relationship with and give them, you know, show them, talk about it and say, 
-hmm. we're just as safe as, as couples who are not mm -hmm. living with HIV. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, huge thing for me. Yeah, that's excellent. So I'm really excited. And you just put that out in the world. So. <laughs> <laughs> Terrence, how about for you? Um, well, yeah, the dating thing works for me too, but, um, <laughs> but my story is a little different. I think, you know, for me, many of you may know, I am an adoptive parent. And for a long time, because of my HIV status, I felt like I could not be a parent. I didn't think that I would be around. I didn't think that it made sense to take responsibility that I couldn't take care of later on in life. Um, and once I became virally suppressed over 10 years ago, my mindset started to change and I figured that I have a right to be a parent. I have a right to have a family um, and stay healthy. And so, you know, I've been, I started this journey and right now I have a six-year-old who just makes my day most days. <laughs> <laughs> um, and life is completely different, but I'm living my dream. And it's just, it's awesome because knowing that I'm going to be around, not if, you know, I'm going to be around to make a difference in his life. And he's completely made a difference in mine. So it's just wonderful. Oh, that's amazing. And Murray, you're a parent too. What, what about your perspective? I, I am. So I'm a parent of a 16 and a 19 year old. So Ooh. mine are a little bit older. And trust me, bit. it's not always going to feel great uh, every morning, yeah. but uh, I, it is a really rewarding experience. Um, you know, I've uh, been positive for 30 years and have always lived, I think, in fear that yeah. I would transmit the virus to someone else. Um, I have been hearing for many, many years about this, you know, undetectable, uh, no transmittable kind of situation. If you look at uh, mother to child transmission, I mean, we've been proving mm -hmm. that for years, right? Definitely. That that uninfectious, you're uninfectious if you are um, have an undetectable viral load. And so, uh, nonetheless, that data has been in my mind all along. But you know, it's not until this study came out, I think, that I started saying, oh, this is really true, and this can really be freeing in mm -hmm. terms of uh, just giving yourself the peace that when you date, and by the way, I'm available too, so, <laughs> <laughs> just so we put that out there. Um, when you date, you don't have to worry about that. That disclosure uh, yes. moment is so difficult, yes. and this brings so much more of a easy conversation about it. Now, I think that the other piece that's really important about it is that the data has to be out there and people have to know that what you're saying is true because I think everyone is going to immediately say, oh, really, mm -hmm. are you sure? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's gonna be a part of this whole yeah. dialogue, but it's really freeing and, I, and I'm really excited to um, try to put that message out there. I know there's lots of work to do in the future to make sure we get this data out there and consistent ways, but individually, it's just a very freeing feeling. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's kind of, like for me anyway, I feel like there's this tension between the intellectual part of my brain, yeah. where it's like, mm -hmm. I know the data, and then there's like living through decades of the epidemic yes. and the emotional stuff yeah. that comes yeah, with sure. it. And it's just kind of taken me a minute to sort of catch up so that the emotional and the intellectual part of my brain are all kind of working hand in hand. And it's, I think it's for a lot of us, it's gonna be a process. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us, we're going to look at these data and we're gonna make slightly different decisions for our own lives and how we implement the data in our lives and how we interact with people. And now Bruce, I know you've been kind of spending a lot of time <laughs> yeah. on this issue. How has it affected you personally? Well, I, I, you know, when I first learned, um, I became undetectable in 2010, first of all, after um, seven years of, of not taking treatment and resisting mm -hmm. treatment until I got sick. And then I finally went on treatment. And two years later in 2012, my doctor told me, you know, um, you're undetectable, then you, you can, don't worry about it. It's, you're not gonna transmit the virus. And I, and I said, are you kidding me? This is what? <laughs> you know, this is incredible. And and can you put that in writing? And he couldn't. <laughs> um, but um, it, you know, f for me, it's it's been. Um, I related to everything everyone everyone said here, and I don't want to reiterate. But I was just like completely relating to what you're saying. And I, w I was single for 13 years, and only recently just became an, uh, got involved in a relationship. And for 13 years, I 
was terrified of, mm -hmm. of, of infecting someone I love. So I didn't love. And to me, the most important thing in life is to love another human being mm -hmm. and be loved in return. And HIV came between me and someone I love solely because I was terrified of infecting that person. And now that I know this, it's on a rational level, I know it exactly mm -hmm. what you're saying. I'm still having trouble internalizing that this yeah. is real. And I've known this since 2012. And I work with the researchers who are telling mm -hmm. me. And, you know, and, and Carl Diffenbach is saying this. And, you know, Murray, you, we're all saying this. Mm -hmm. And it's still hard to internalize. One of the challenges is, I mean, interesting story quickly, is that my doctor, even in New York City three months ago, and I'm in the middle of this campaign, you know, emailing and Skyping with the researchers who know this stuff. My doctor told me I was a 4% risk. To, to anyone I'd had sex with. Uh -huh. And he misinterpreted HPTN 052. And this is a major HIV infectious disease specialist in New York City because he looked at that 96% number of mm. based on early treatment um, and he thought that w was related to undetectable. But even if he was talking about early treatment, no one knows what 96% means. Mm -hmm. You know, 96%, it, I even thought it meant a 4% risk. So, of course, I'm not going to have sex with someone that I love. I'm not going to, you know, so... It's, it's been life-changing, and we struggle all the time to get this information out to people. And I've been taking a break from Facebook for that particular reason, because especially um, uh, cis uh, males who are um, HIV negative are incredibly um, aggressive about keeping us dangerous to them, keeping us separate in a way, I should say. And that viral divide, they just want to maintain it because it's what they know. You know, and it's, there's a lot of fear and 35, deeply, uh, in, uh, 35 years of deeply entrenched fears of HIV and people with HIV that we are now trying to counteract. Yeah, and I think, you know, definitely, we, I think we have a lot of baggage personally Absolutely. from living through this epidemic, yeah. mm -hmm. and collectively as a field, we have a lot of baggage, and it's going to take time to let go of some of that, but it's incredibly important that we do the work that needs to be done to make sure that what we're doing in our programs, what we're saying to people in our interactions, in clinical visits, in case management sessions, yes. that we are on point and that we are using the most accurate information and we're talking about it in the right way because this matters not just for preventing new HIV infections, but it matters to the lives of people living with HIV. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, if people living with HIV are undetectable, are virally suppressed, and cannot transmit the virus, why do we need stigma? Hmm. What, 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 what so is, is, you know, really, what, what, what's going to happen with stigma? Just think about what it's going to mean. So let's kind of spend just a couple minutes talking about what do you think needs to change? because of these data. Gina? In Louisiana, the first thing that we need to change is our criminalization laws. Absolutely. We have got to get rid of those draconian laws, and we, we have the proof. You know, I think back to um, 1994 when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was diagnosed, and I went on 076, which was a study to mm -hmm. see if a mom taking medicine could not pass it to her baby. And my daughter, she'll be 22 in November, and she's negative still. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so we know this. We know treatment works. We know treatment as prevention works. If only we could get our, our legislators to understand what we're saying. Yeah. So as you said, the researchers are getting this data together. They have this data. Now we can go to the, the um, Capitol and say, look, this is what we're saying. This mm -hmm. is what we're saying. As long as these laws are on the books, Absolutely. we're stigmatizing people. We're making people not get tested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're making people afraid to disclose their status. Mm -hmm. You know, and the stigma is huge, and y'all know the numbers mm -hmm. in the South. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. this information, we, we keep, you know, we're always talking about getting a zero, ending the epidemic, blah, blah, blah. This is it. This is how it's going to happen. This is it. Exactly. You know, right? This, exactly. this information. Yeah, yeah. Uh, excellent. Bruce, what about you? Um, well, I think in terms of, I mean, I, 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 I'm so honored to be on this panel because you're all, you're so on point, and it's, and um, I think that, for us, it's really, again, it's just getting it out, and as you're saying, in a meaningful way, getting this information, because once you get the information out, and we have a consensus statement um, that you can use online, uh, preventionaccess.org, and it's, it's endorsed by the 
co and principal investigators from the top studies, as well as Dimitri Daskalakis um, from, uh, from New York City, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, who's a pioneer, and from um, NASDAQ, from Murray's organization. And uh, it, it, it clarifies there is negligible risk, which is a legal term. So you, this can be used kind of in, in, in every setting, this core, that the science is confirmed. Um, or you can use whatever other statements that, you, that work for you to convey that when you're HIV positive and you're undetectable and the sort of the scientific uh, uh, consensus is after a six month period of time and on treatment, you are, you are not capable of transmitting the virus, you are not infectious, um, whatever way that works for you to convey it, that transmission uh, stops at treatment. Um, so do it in a meaningful way. And I think it also has to be created with people with HIV. We need to be at the table creating these campaigns. So um, when the campaigns are developed, you need to have um, people with trans experience, um, uh, people of, of color, young, young black males, young Latino males, black women. Um, it, it, it need, we need to be at the table because some of the campaigns are really well intentioned, but they, they don't speak to the people that are most vulnerable to HIV and living with HIV. So um, bring these people to the, get, to, to the table. You can talk to people like Cecilia Chung from Chand Chandra Law Center, Arietta uh, Lint from uh, uh, Trans Latina Coalition, or Daniel Driffin from, from Thrive, or um, Venton uh, Jones from a National Black Justice Coalition. Um, I mean, there's so many different Ton groups. Where you can bring tons and tons of people. Yeah, and unfortunately, we're not going to have time to <laughs> name them all. There are incredible people yeah. in this field that can connect you with people with yeah. HIV. So. And I think it's, it's clear that this matters to our lives, and it's a way to bring people living with HIV together. Mm -hmm. And we need to be heard. So, yes. Parents, what about you? No, I. Well, ditto to what everything has, that has been said, but I definitely think that you asked what needs to change, and I think more people who are living with HIV need to speak up more. We need to be more visible, we need to be more active in our respective communities um, to let them know what it means to live with HIV and how we have successful, you know, amazing lives, fulfilled lives, and that we don't have to live in the shadows. And that's part of breaking the stigma. Um, so I think for me, it's more getting folks who, you know, especially people who, well, no, everyone. I was going to say people who are newly infected, but it's everyone, because stigma, as you said, has ingrained so many of our minds for so long. But it's getting us to a point to just live proudly and boldly in who we are um, and speaking our truths and being real about what the disease really is and the impact that it has on not just us but on everyone. So, um, you know, for me, I'm always about, you know, very clear, this is who I am, this is, you know, everything I've done, this is where I'm going. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's exciting to see more people, you know, getting uh, bolder in who they are, but we have a long way to go. Because um, mm -hmm. stigma, as we know, just really does crush so many of us, especially those of us in the African American community. Um, but my big thing would be to definitely get more of us to speak loudly and proudly and publicly about what it means to live with HIV, to be virally suppressed, and you know what we intend to do with our lives. Yeah, and even I think the the most evolved of us carry a little bit of that stigma oh, of inside of ourselves. Absolutely. And this is an opportunity to let go mm -hmm. of that last little bit. So, Murray? Well, I get to go last, so I have to say ditto to everything. <laughs> you, you all made, obviously, the, um, the important points. I want to emphasize again the importance of the messaging and the data mm -hmm. being out there so that people can consistently hear the same thing. I think it's just critical that the same message is out there. Bruce, you brought it up, 4%. Do I have a 4% yeah. risk of transmitting or do I not have a risk of transmitting? So understanding that and being very clear about that, I think our government can help with that. I think our government should help with that very urgently because the science is clear. I think we can help as um, organizations that are doing this work in really being consistent in that messaging. Mm -hmm. And I think individually we can help with that messaging. It's interesting, you know, I think that um, we all play a role in various pieces of the of ending the HIV epidemics. And I think one of the things that we as people living with HIV can do is also 
keep track of our own health. Clearly, Absolutely. this doesn't work if individually we're not going to the doctor regularly, checking Absolutely. our viral load, making sure that we're virally suppressed. And one of the things that this data has done for me is it's emphasized more, more, more that you really do have to take those pills every mm -hmm. single day and be adherent. And I'll, you know, yeah. I'll be the first to say, I haven't always been 100% adherent. It's hard to, to do that. And when you know that there's a goal of, I am not gonna transmit this virus to anyone, it, it ups the ante a little bit. And I think that's really, really important as well. So it's really on all of us. It's not just you know our agencies that have to put the message out. It's on us as individuals. It's collectively on all of us together, really figuring out how to use this to the advantage and really go towards that goalpost of ending the epidemic. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for being here. I literally have 30 seconds. I think it's as important. <laughs> so here's the other thing is that this cannot even be said unless we address the barriers as well to, to treatment because everyone needs the opportunity to become undetectable. And we need to make sure that um, the federal health agencies, is, 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 uh, agencies are responsive in, in that way. So set, setting up environments where people can get access to treatment and stay on treatment. There are so many barriers, but that's another issue. No, that but, but I, think, I think that's a critically important thing and that's a good note to end on. We have to flip the script. So mm -hmm. often when we talk about people not being virally suppressed, yeah. we talk about the deficiencies in the person living with HIV mm -hmm. and all the things that people living with HIV are having to deal with. We talk about mental health issues, mm -hmm. substance abuse mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. poverty, transportation. And those are real issues, but the responsibility for getting to viral suppression doesn't just rest with the person. That's right. If Absolutely. someone's not virally suppressed, Absolutely. That healthcare provider is not doing his or her job. Absolutely. And let's face it, the healthcare system doesn't make it easy for us to get virally suppressed mm -mm. and stay virally right. suppressed. The healthcare system is nine out of ten times designed for the convenience of the provider, for the convenience of the insurer and yes. the payer. And it's not easy mm -mm. to do all the things that have to be done. Um, but I think this has just kind of been the tip of the iceberg to yeah. a really important conversation that has been going on here in the hallways at USCA mm -hmm. and I know is happening out there around the country as well. So I hope that we can do our parts to keep the conversation going. Um, and I do think that 20 years from now, when we look back at 2016, we are going to say that this was an incredible moment in history mm -hmm. where the paradigm shifted, and we saw the beginning to the end of new HIV infections around the world. So thank you for being here with us today on Facebook Live, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you in lots of other settings. Bye-bye. <laughs>